Um, this presentation is uh, based on the material that I am working with uh, in my uh, on my PhD. Uh, that's uh, entitled what do I uh, "An Urban Way of Life: Urban Practices, Networks, and Identities in Odense in the Medieval Period, Odense in Denmark." Uh, my presentation has two main uh, points, and one is uh, to present some thoughts on how to characterize uh, the early town with Odense as an example. And the second one is to present some thoughts uh, from my PhD work um, in relation to this. And I should say I started my PhD work uh, half a year ago. So uh, The material uh, that uh, um, uh, the excavation that provided uh, the source material uh, to my work uh, took place in Odense, uh, which you've seen in a map earlier, uh, central Denmark and Funen, uh, and it took place from May 2013 to September 2014. And here you see the, the, uh, uh, the place, and uh, you can sort of sense the, uh, the outline of, of the medieval town and this is a river running through the town. Uh, and just south of that is a Nonnebakken, as a mess my colleague uh, mentioned earlier. We excavated um, an area of, it was a rescue excavation, and we excavated an area of approximately 2,500 square meters and around 4,200 cubic meters of cultural layers uh, were served, and this is in the uh, central part of the medieval town. And a coherent area, area of that size and location uh, has never before been excavated in Odense. Although the area had been heavily truncated by uh, modern construction activity, the outcome of the excavation uh, was superseding our expectations, uh, and that was partly because of very good preservation conditions for wood and other organic um, material. Um, here are some pictures. We have uh, latrine barrels, as you see here. There they are. Both the barrels and the content was uh, very well preserved. They date, the barrels date uh, to the uh, mid 14th century. We also have these uh, barrel or cask line uh, wells with the same dating, and these, uh, it, uh, I've got to put a measure, uh, but it's a very small wooden uh, beaker made from pine. And uh, both these uh, finds, uh, the finds assemblage, like wooden uh, objects and lots of ceramics, uh, and also uh, larger features and structures such as booths or stalls, houses, stables, latrines, paths, roads, and and much more uh, was uh, was brought to light, and um, and it gives a unique us a unique opportunity to study this period, and also because the excavation uh, was undertaken by using a stratigraphic uh, method, and we also integrated natural sciences uh, by sampling for macrobotanical analysis, zooarchaeological, and micromorphological analysis. And uh, just to show you, uh, this is a post-medieval map, but uh, it uh, shows that uh, the excavated area was situated here, just on and south of the main road running through uh, uh, Odense. And just south of it was uh, the cemetery and church of St. Albany, and also the cathedral uh, from around 1100. Um, and in St. Albany church, that was where uh, King Canute later the Holy, uh, was killed in 1086 before the altar, as you see here, in a somewhat later source. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, the medieval uh, period, uh, the town was probably covering an area of 32 hectare, and it was not completely occupied by houses, as, as uh, you can see in this um, as well. Some of, uh, some of the area were um, gardens or just not occupied. 
and approximately 2,000 people was living inside the boundaries of the town. So, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, showing the excavation, the excavated area, uh, with some of the oldest features, uh, consisting of uh, post post-built houses and wells. Is these blue dots here, and a feature here to the north that I will get get back to in a minute. Uh, but it does present a challenge to characterize the nature of this early settlement. Um, yeah, and it, it, it does seem to date to uh, the 11th or 12th century. And the micromorphological analysis showed that the ground was pre prepared to some extent by laying out, out turf. And the pollen analysis shows uh, signs of cultivation in the area, but we didn't have any traces of, of actual like plowing or anything. Um, but uh, the challenge also lies in the fact that for an urban excavation, this is a large uh, area. But if we compare it to other excavations in rural settings, it's a rather small excavation. So uh, that's what I did. <laughs> um, farm units are usually recognized and studied over a, a, an area much larger. And here it's a village called Rungeby, which is just south of Odense. And an area ten times as big as the one in Odense has been excavated. And 41 medieval buildings have, have been uh, exposed and, um, and four farmsteads. And in green I've put the area, uh, similar to the excavated area in Odense, I just put it in a random place. Uh, so it sort of uh, shows um, the challenges. Um, and, and you could argue that uh, you need a bigger area to actually understand the settlement in Odense. And if the features are, if we zoom in, um, it's actually also hard to tell which one of these two uh, is uh, the town, or what later becomes the town. But at least one feature helps us investigate the nature uh, of the settlement in Odense at, at this time, suggesting that it is different from the settlement in, in the village of Rungeby. In the northern part, <coughs> uh, of the excavated area was a paved road, and that's what you see here. Um, and of course it was truncated, but we had a fairly large bit of it. And the paving was dated to the 12th century, early uh, 12th century. And it's contemporary what, uh, with what seems to be this uh, sparse or dispersed settlement. The road is very well built. The topsoil has been dug away. Uh, prior to its establishment, and it consists of small stones and bone, and it shows signs of maintenance. Um, and it actually runs over a distance of at least 30 meters. In uh, Lund, in southern Sweden, uh, the early phases of the town, which is approximately 100 years before uh, in Odense, uh, is uh, likewise characterized by a dispersed settlement. And the features that are interpreted as the first signs of uh, the development into a town uh, are regulations of plots, changes in housing structure, and public streets. So, on one hand, we have a pattern of houses that's hard to distinguish uh, from the structure of a village, but a road that stands out and has the characteristics of what in other places is interpreted as traits of a town. In the later phases, the housing structure changes, masonry houses, timber frame houses, and so on are built, Settlement becomes denser, uh, and a medieval townscape emerges. Um, and the uh, paving uh, of the street is constantly renewed, and in the beginning of the 14th century, uh, we have these small uh, booths or stalls, interpreted as marked stalls, um, in, and in the written sources they're mentioned as uh, fish stalls. In the backyard area, at this time, uh, we have two features. Um, that might be seen as differing from the concept of a town, and that is manure heaps. Uh, these heaps were contained in wooden structures, and one interpretation, as we heard there might be others, <laughs> um, is that it was used to store manure and other types of waste, also general waste, either as hotbeds, as, as, as was mentioned, but also to contain the manure. Uh, I imagine that over winter maybe it would be uh, practical. 
Um, but these heaps are mainly evidence of livestock being present in the backyard areas uh, in the 13th, uh, 14th century. Sorry. And this uh, presence of animals uh, in the settlement that now has a character very different from a rural settlement is supported by the presence of a stable from the 15th century. These are the remains of it, uh, the, a foundation made from wood, floor layers and lower parts of the walls, and the activity layers left no doubt of the use of the building. It contained mainly of, of manure and wood chippings and such. So. Animals. Animals were an important contribution to life in the town. They would act as draft animals, provide milk and uh, for different purposes, leather and meat. And they could be fed with leftovers from different types of activities, such as brewing or household waste, if it was pigs. And thus it was transforming uh, an, in an uncomfortable waste product into a valuable resource the manure. Uh, and in the end, animal uh, manure was a valuable resource and it made it possible to make the most of the soil available to the inhabitants of the town. Fertilizing the ground would increase the outcome of the small patches of soil that were available within the town limits. When the stable in Uinza was built, it seems that the contained manure heaps uh, disappeared and it coincides with the appearance of the first paved surfaces within the plots, which makes it possible that the manure now was placed in these paved areas. Uh, but for the late medieval period, it's more likely that it was transported out of the town uh, in a more organized way. So it means that it was no longer the individual inhabitant that benefited from the manure. Um, and we know from around 1500 that uh, the medieval version of the uh, waste collector, the nightman, uh, existed. And in the late medieval uh, written sources, there are also complaints about abandoned areas being used, at used as manure dumps or manure piling <coughs> up outside the city gates. And that's another indication of manure or household waste is no longer seen as a valuable resource. Uh, and it indirectly suggests that farming plays a less important role. So the results from the excavation in Odense underlines that farming at an urban scale, or keeping animals at least, uh, was a part of urban life. It may have changed character throughout the Middle Ages and gone from a primary uh, source of income uh, to play a more secondary role or play a role for fewer people in the town. Um, and does this characterize Ulland as, as an agrarian town in the, in the Middle Ages? No, but it shows that uh, the boundaries between uh, agrarian and urban are not fixed. Urban lifestyle is not limited to the town, and rural lifestyle is not limited to rural areas. Um, <clears throat> these examples also underline that a different approach is called for when looking at towns or urbanism <coughs> and what characterizes the urban way of life. Towns are not only defined by size, population, density or speciali specialized production, but it's also a dynamic place where a particular form of social interaction and organization takes place, as Lewis Worth put it in his uh, Urbanism as a Way of Life from 1938. Or as uh, Axel Kostovosen recently has described it, um, the town as a social place where dynamic patterns of practice is performed. So the archaeological record, streets, manure, heaps, etc., they are materialized practices and can be studied as such. These practices forms, develops and eventually collapses. And it's in that dynamic process that urbanism and urbanity is described. As such, the street uh, is not only an expression of an infrastructure or a, a topo topography, but it's also a way to study the practices of the town. So I think it's important to ask questions like, how was this work organized? How is all the, the rubble and stones, um, uh, where did it come from? Uh, how is the road maintained? Uh, and what does it say about the relation between public and private areas? And how does this change over time? With this approach, we will be able to describe the practices and dynamics of the town, and thus the urban way of life. Thank you.